you know, I mean, I didn't know him at all. Like, I, I mean, but the thing is, is like everyone knew him. He was always at a, like bars that I hung out at, um, just sitting around, drawing, talking loudly. You'd see him handing out CDs or selling his CDs at shows. You saw him outside the Metro, you saw him outside the Vic, the Riv, the Aragon. You saw him on every bus you were ever on. And he would always be like trying to sell whatever he had. He just promoted himself so well. Wow, this guy is so strange and funny and, and has such a unique perspective on the world. So finally we started asking him, you know, what, what songs he was going to play that night and came out with the first one saying he's going to play the rock jam Blink-182. <laughs> and we're like, oh that's cool, what else are you going to play? And uh, really loud he screams, I'm going to play the song Suck a Doberman's Ass. So that's when the ladies next to us started looking over. And about halfway through dinner, the ladies were like asking who he was and what he did. And he replied, you know, I'm a rock star. I play that rock music. So one lady kind of figured out that her kids knew who he was. He made her come over and did his old uh, headbutt routine with her. I really wish that like it was my mom doing it because I'd love to meet those kids when they came home and their mom was like, yeah, I was headbutting Wesley Wills at the Cheesecake Factory today. Play the rock guitar, rock it harder like a magic kiss. Rock and roll is the music, whip your cheetah's ass on stage. Scream, Dracula, scream. Scream, Dracula, scream. Scream, Dracula, scream. Scream, Dracula, scream. Wesley Willis was by far the most full of life person I've ever met in my whole life. Like everyone who's in Chicago who's into rock music, we, we get that. We get, you know, Wesley Will, oh yeah, you know, it's like one of those things. You think Chicago, you think it's your star, or you think Wesley Will? You go hand in hand. Wesley was more than physically larger than life. He was an intimidating character. I mean, he stood about 6'5 or 6'6. He had to weigh about 350 pounds, and he wanted to headbutt you. I don't know too many people that walking down the street, if this man approached you and said, headbutt me, if the be going in on <laughs> something like that. It's an incredibly unique individual who was really hardworking, driven. He had certain um, challenges, you know, schizophrenia, possibly autism, whatever, whatever it was that, you know, limited him in some ways and made him u unique. And he just kind of took all those things and turned it into positive. I think a lot of people were kind of concerned that he might lash out or something, but he really only lashed out at himself. He would hit himself on the head sometimes when he had problems with the voices. He broke a lot of CD players early in his career, <laughs> before he became a rock star even, but mostly afterwards, because he had the money to replace them more quickly. There was a time coming home uh, late one night from working where I was in the red line. I'm all by myself, and there's this large black man that's rather intimidating looking from far away, and and he's coming towards me and I was just not feeling comfortable so I, I got on a payphone and he's mumbling and yelling and uh, I hear him talking about phones and um, and then I hear uh, uh, I hear more get off the phones and I and I say Nate um, I, Wesley Willis is a couple feet away from me and he's telling me to get off the phone and uh, and right as I'm saying that uh, Wesley Willis comes up to the phone and, and hits the uh, disconnect clicker and uh, as I step away from the phone, and then, and then he passes me like this, and then I just kind of hang up the phone, and, and then I had to get home and call Nate and, and tell him that I wasn't really sure what just happened, but, but uh, Wesley Willis ended our phone call, and uh, it, was, it was a nice experience because it proved to me that, uh, that I, I didn't have anything to be scared of. Uh, except for losing a couple minutes on a phone card. You know, he had kind of a sing-song way about him, and uh, you know, even asking to make a deposit or withdraw money. Can I get the money? <laughs> I said the money, the money. <laughs> and so he would like come up to a good, crowded bank, you know, and and I'm Clive Warren, you know, just be like pretty customers and people in line frustrated, and he'd be screaming and singing, pulling out his nickels. He was not the conventional artist. Because he created nothing from a commercial standpoint. He only created things from his own personal standpoint. 
he drew street scenes. He drew things that he, they, that were part of his life. You know, he'd either sit and draw it from sight or draw it from memory in any angle of Chicago, any building. He could identify each and every building, you know, pen and ink. I had him draw the bar from across the street. And here's this huge man singing at the top of his lungs, sitting in a lawn chair, drawing the bar with headphones on, singing. And people walking on the street had no idea what was going on. And I saw all afternoon, I watched people cross the street, walk on the other side of the street, because they were so afraid of, of, of Wesley. And, and here, you couldn't see a happier, more peaceful, loving guy. I think at Wesley's contri like contribution to the Chicago scene is easily one of the strangest and most unique. I don't know too many musicians who carry around their records and are constantly trying to sell them to people. It's not that cool, I guess, to be walking around and saying, find my record, find my record, find my record. No one's really gonna do that. And that's what Wes did. But he's, he sold out of hundreds. I mean, I, I can't even, I think Wesley put out 50 records. He may have put out more than 50 records. He probably printed a thousand of each. So did he sell 50,000 records by himself on the street out of a bag? He's not the typical kind of songwriter singer. Wesley wrote songs based on the people he knew, based on the bands that he went to see. He would talk about the bands he loved or the producers he loved or, you know, camels and put them all into one song. Like Joe Biafra said, he, he is punk rock and that's kind of what it is. It's just raw honesty. My favorite Wesley Willis song is the first song I ever heard was I Whoop Super Superman's Ass is probably my favorite Wesley Willis song. I kicked big Batman's ass. I whooped Batman's ass by far. It was almost like a threat to Superman. I want to suck a camel's ass. Sorry I got fat. Scream Dracula scream. Absolutely. Casper the motherfucking friendly homosexual ghost. Tonight there's going to be a jailbreak motherfucker. Standing outside the club. Scary, freaky people. Batman was getting on my nerves. He was running me amok. Superman was being an asshole. <laughs> Superman was looking at me. Yeah. Superman was being a prick. He really cued me calling me a bum. He came up to me and pushed me to the ground. And then I kicked his ass. I whooped Batman's ass. I kicked Batman's ass. I whooped Superman's ass. I whooped Superman's ass. I want to suck a camel's ass. Tammy Smith. Lannis Morissette is a rock star. Tammy Smith. Scream, Dragon, let's scream. Tammy Smith. Morbid Angel. Tammy Smith. Kind of over and over. And then, you know, over and over, repeat. <laughs> The Rock Over London. Rock Over London. Rock Over London. And rock on Chicago. Rock on Chicago. American Express. Never leave home without it. Rock on the Magic Kiss. I don't know if Wesley was secretly corporate corporate sponsor. I thought, dude, anyone who can like combine a childhood character and motherfucking is just he's he's awesome. Because if you can whoop Superman's ass, you're a badass. And Wesley is a badass if you whoop Superman's ass, and I believe it. It's guaranteed to, to haunt me and put a smile on my face all at the same time. Hey, where have you gone? You're used to going down to the metro. Not to say you take them for granted, but like when you would go down there, you'd be like, oh, it's Wesley. You know, it's something you always saw. And now going there, it's like you expect to see him. You expect to run into him somewhere. That's I'm going to miss running into him, running into Wesley Willis. And it was weird because you kind of took, you know, he was like always, he was just one of those things. He was always around, so you kind of took that for granted. Like, oh, it's Wesley Willis. Wesley's gone now, so that's like, I can't ever see him again, you know, so. The magic that was Wesley is something that I miss Wesley, and I don't think anybody could have really known how much they'd miss him, because for a lot of people, he was annoying. They wanted to avoid him, you know, they gave him the creeps or whatever. But a day doesn't go by that I don't wish the guy would walk through the door. You know, despite his weight and his illness and hearing voices and, you know, all these things that he kind of had to deal with that were hard for him. It didn't, like, ruin his, his like, loving embrace of just existing and just being alive. So, you know, I, th I think he really lived his dream and really lived a good life. 
it's just it really sucks that he's gone you know we did go um on the last day of Leslie's life and um Leslie was really out of it today but he did hold my hand and look at me for two seconds and say I'll be okay I guess he is okay It's the world's best-selling gasoline. 